Cool, so we're gonna go through a small workshop and we're gonna demonstrate proving on iOS devices, sort of a proof of concept for proving on mobile devices. Um, a little bit of introduction, I'm Darvish, I'm a, an iOS engineer at Puzzle. Uh, we build all kinds of tooling on top of um, CK privacy chains and yeah, we're very excited to be here. So before we start, uh, Make sure you've downloaded Xcode um, and you've cloned our repo and you've also downloaded the Puzzle Wallet extension. Um, you'll need all those three things. There's links down there for all three of those um, in case you need to follow along. So before we get into the workshop, just a quick overview of why you would want to build on mobile in the first place. The biggest reason, that's where the users are. If you look at global trends for internet access, we see that 60% of web access around the world happens on mobile phones. And if you look at emerging markets like Africa and Asia, you'll see that number even higher, 69% in Asia, 75% in Africa. So increasingly, users are not using their desktop devices to access the internet. And so if we want to onboard the next billion users, we'll have to meet them where they are, which is on mobile. Additionally, mobile gives you some amazing hardware features that you don't get with a desktop or in a web environment. For example, you get Secure Enclave uh, on Apple devices, which is a hardware-separated secure execution environment, similar to SGX. Um, and that allows for just an additional layer of security, which is really important when you're, you're dealing with sensitive data, like financial information, healthcare information. You also get access to a GPU and a multi-threaded, uh, and, and a CPU that's architecture that supports multi-threading, multi-core CPUs. Um, multi-threading on iOS and on Android is a very mature ecosystem, and there's a lot of very sophisticated tooling available so you can get the most performance for your uh, apps. And you get auth systems that people are already used to. So Face ID, Touch ID, uh, these are authentication mechanisms that users are already familiar with and they trust them. And we can leverage those to build apps that they also trust. And the biggest one is just engagement. Um, people will always have their phones on them and that can be leveraged to drive usage, to drive adoption, uh, to get people into your apps and help them enjoy the apps. So one of the biggest ones that we've seen personally is uh, because people always have their phones on them, you can, you can bring people into your app as you meet them where they are. Uh, we saw that with, we work with EmpireDAO to build a fundraising platform for them and we saw that when they were at events, they were handing a QR code to people to go to their website and check it out and so they wanted people to be able to donate from their phones, but because we didn't support mobile at the time, uh, they couldn't use the platform. And so it was, it, it led to less engagement than ideal. Another advantage is you get to use uh, push notifications, which users are increasingly becoming very familiar with. And both Apple and the Android ecosystem are pushing um, for wider adoption of push notifications. Uh, you can do smart pushes now, they can be interactive, they can be rich notifications with pictures and video, and you can use all of those things to drive people um, to use your app and also just notify them of important events. Uh, something that we've run into is while building multi-sigs, we realize that if your multi-sig is proposing a transaction and you need n number of people to prove it, if they have to all wait till they get back home to their desktop or laptop to do that, then you're gonna wait a long time to approve transactions. If they can just approve transactions on their phone, then you end up increasing the speed by an order of magnitude. And lastly, you have native payments integration. So Apple Pay and Google Pay, again, are payment systems that users are already very familiar with. They trust them. They're familiar with like how they use. They've got bank accounts and all the off-ramps, on-ramps set up. So you're able to integrate with those directly. Before we get into the actual workshop, we just wanted to touch on some of the problems that need to be solved before 
mobile proving can become a thing. And one of the, or sorry, the two main reason, uh, the, the two main regions of uh, problem solving that we need to do uh, are around state management and proof generation. So for privacy-based change, most of them follow the UTXO model of notes, spent, unspent, nullified trees, and we need somewhere to manage that state. Um, if any of you have used a privacy chain before or interacted with it, you're probably familiar with this initial giant time-consuming step where your device has to sync the entire world state, find all the UTXOs that you own, figure out if they're spent or not spent. So um, that is a problem that you also have to solve on mobile, except you're very constrained because you cannot just download a whole blockchain onto a mobile device. You don't have that much room. So uh, that, is, um, that is something that you have to figure out before you can make your chain uh, usable on mobile devices. Uh, that is not what we'll be focusing on today. We think that is a problem uh, area that needs to be addressed, but, um, and there's some very promising work in that, in that re um, area, but we're gonna focus on the second uh, pro set of problems, which is around proof generation um, execution traces. So this involves generally building a circuit, uh, which is you know translating your code into constraints and then into um, actual bytecode and generating proving, generally also verifying keys for your um, program and then creating the actual proof data. And depending on the chain, this can be anywhere from a few kilobytes to a few megabytes. And that's kind of the problem area that we'll be focusing on today and demonstrating today. Uh, but we just want to highlight that the other area is also important and needs to be solved. Oh, sorry. Cool. So where do we stand right now? Right now, mobile is mobile interaction with blockchains is in a very early stage, mostly like the rest of this space. Um, the ecosystem around non-privacy focused chains like Ethereum is pretty is, is getting to a pretty mature place now. Uh, you can use any number of Ethereum wallets on mobile, and they leverage some of the hardware features we talked about. A lot of them store keys in the keychain. Um, some even uh, try to support secure enclave for doing things like signing messages and uh, approving transactions and that kind of thing. The issue is because these are non-privacy focused or, or actually non-ZK uh, wallets, there is no proof generation that needs to be done. And so the actual computation involved to sign a message is relatively small compared to generating a zero knowledge proof. And that we are able to do today. So what we're not able to do is more complex computations like generating a zero knowledge proof. One potential solution is offloading this computation to, a, to another device. It could be uh, something like, a, like what MobileCoin does or with using SGX um, in a server somewhere. And, but that involves sending your circuit inputs, private inputs, off somewhere else. And you can use you know, private information retrieval, create a trusted execution environment, and demonstrate that the computer that's executing your transaction cannot actually compute, or cannot actually see any of that data. But it still involves sending private inputs somewhere. Um, and this only exists because of the limitations of a mobile device. Um, we think that in an ideal world, mobile devices are actually able to do all proof generation on device. And so we don't have to send private inputs anywhere, and that would create a lot of peace of mind and just be more secure than uh, sending private uh, inputs off somewhere else. So with that in mind, that's the ideal state. We're getting there. We're not there yet. And uh, yeah, we're going to try and demonstrate what this looks like today and hopefully in some ideas about where, how we can improve it in the future. Cool, so we're gonna get to the workshop now. If anyone's trying to follow along, this will be the URL. It is puzzlehu slash, slash ZK Summit iOS workshop, that's the repo, and it's also down there um, if you wanna take a look. So, and this has instructions for the whole workshop already, so um, in case you fall behind or need a second, this, these instructions are um, pretty much what we're gonna do here today. And I will also be demonstrating these on here in case you can't follow along. 
uh, if you're curious or if you're on a Windows laptop, which is fine. <laughs> um, cool, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna navigate to this website. We've built a little, I believe it's zkSummit10.vercel.app, yeah. And that is also on that little page over there. So this is just a little demo website we built that will help you see um, the executions that you're running. And the goal of the workshop is you will run against an ALIO program and you'll, you'll do an execution against an ALIO program, we'll broadcast a transaction to the chain so that we can see that it was like a valid transaction that we executed and then you'll be able to see the results um, in this DAP. So to get started, we're gonna connect our wallet and this is gonna prompt you to download Puzzle Wallet, which is something uh, we developed at Puzzle. It's a wallet that currently supports Alio in the future, any number of other privacy chains and um, uses infrastructure that we've developed at Puzzle to make the experience of using privacy chains as simple and intuitive as possible. So we're gonna go here and we'll get a little modal that this DAP wants to connect and yeah, now we're connected to this DAP. So if you're connecting for the first time, you'll see that your uh, balance here will be zero and the, we can just ignore the second line for now. So our goal here is to allow you or anyone using this to mint some of these tokens that we've come up with, the ZK Summit 10 token and mint some and also be able to transfer some. So if you're not familiar with interacting with uh, on-chain program, essentially you have a piece of code deployed on-chain somewhere and we will just be calling specific functions on that deploy program with some specific inputs. Um, very familiar to like, sort of any, anyone who's done, uh, interacted with a smart, smart contract before. So, I'm gonna go back to the, oh, sorry. Go back to my workshop here. So we're at step two, um, connecting your wallet. And step three is to grab some ALO credits. So if you don't have ALO credits, um, you can text their faucet or you can let one of us know and we will be happy to provide you with some if you're trying to do some development. Cool. So the next step is gonna be uh, cloning the repo, which might take a second, so we'll give people a chance to do that. Uh, the repo link is also on this um, paper down here, by the way. Um, but if not, you can also just look for puzzlehg slash ZK Summit iOS workshop. Cool. And now we can get to an actual demo. So, sorry. This is the demo app. It's fairly simple, doesn't do much. Essentially, it's just a way to execute against an arbitrary smart contract uh, that's deployed on Alio. The main file that you would need to interact with is content v.swift, which is where we have all the code that shows this page right here. So I'm gonna get rid of all of this and we can fill all that in together.
So as you can see, right now, I have a 100 ZK Summit tokens, and we're gonna try and run an execution that allows us to uh, get some more. And so, just so uh, people have an idea of what we're actually running here, um, I'm going to first pull up the code for for the smart contracts, just so we can see um, what functions we'll be executing against. So the, and you don't need to do this, this is just for demonstration. Um, but this is what the contract is named. Oh, one second. There you go. So if you're curious, this is the, the code for the smart contract looks like. And it's pretty standard token stuff, very basic. Uh, essentially, the function that we'll be using today is uh, mint private. And as you can see, this function takes in two inputs. One is the address that is that will get the newly minted uh, coins and then the second input is a unsigned 64-bit integer. That is just the amount, that amount of tokens that the address will be getting. Um, obviously, again, it's a super simplified thing. Generally, you wouldn't just be able to mint as many tokens as you want for yourself. But for the purposes of demonstration, this this should be sufficient. So our demo is going to execute against this mint private function. So if I go back to our workshop, let's see, there you go. We are at step, oh, actually, yeah, we are at step eight. These are a little out of order, but um, yeah. Actually, sorry, we need to do step six first. I skipped a step there. But before we can execute, we need to provide our execution with a private key to generate the proofs, and a fee record to pay the fee for uh, the execution. So to get those, I'm gonna go back to Chrome. I'm gonna pull up my puzzle wallet. I'm going to go here, I'm gonna copy my private key. I'm gonna put this key right at the top, contv.swift. Um, the private key variable, and then I need a record to pay my fees. So um, if you're familiar with other UTXO type chains, it's called, uh, the, these records can be called notes, um, but essentially this is just a piece of data that um, shows that you have a certain number of credits and you can pay the fee to execute this transaction. So to do that, I'm going to go into my records tab and Go to the unspent records, and you can use any of the records that uh, are associated with the credits.alia program. So I'm gonna use this one that's unspent. I'm gonna click on it to copy it, and I'm going to put that into this fee record variable. So that's the only two inputs I need. And now I'm gonna go back in and run this demo app, it's gonna take a second to compile. Awesome, so now we are almost ready to execute. So again, um, to run the execution, these are the, these are the parameters um, and yeah, if you're curious about the actual source code, um, we just saw that here. So um, this is the program name, ZK Summit token v10 .alio, the function name we saw earlier, 
It's called Mint Private. So I'm going to put that in here. And our inputs. So our first input is the address that will be getting the new tokens. So to get that, we go back into my, oops, sorry. We go back into my wallet. I am going to copy this time my address and put that into the first field. The second field, the second input here is uh, unsigned 64-bit integer, which is the amount of tokens that you want to mint. So I'm going to say we're going to get 50 tokens. And because we don't do type conversions yet, you have to just put in the type of this number, which is an unsigned 64, bless you, 64-bit uh, uh, integer. And yeah, we can do a couple runs. Um, for the first one, we're just going to run as is, and then we can cache. Actually, we'll, we'll have it cache the keys, just so we can see what this looks like. And yeah, now we can just run this program. We go back to Xcode, and we're going to see this execution trace here. So I will also switch to a memory view, so we can just see utilization, and you can see why we are kind of a bit of a ways away from being able to do executions very efficiently on mobile devices. Um, this is a multi-threaded implementation, which is why you see usage over 100%. But yeah, if you look at the execution trace, it computed the trace, um, the constraints. It generated a proof. Then it did a proof for the fee transaction, obviously. And then it broadcast this transaction. So uh, that's a transaction ID after a successful execution. And so if I were to go back to build a token and refresh this, probably give it a second to sync. Let's see if we can see this transaction in our activity. There you go. So it's been private here. OK, might have to disconnect. I think I have to disconnect the that before. Oh, there you go. Yeah, just needed a second. Uh, but yeah, we see the that we now have fifty more fifty more tokens. Um, and yeah, that's that's the workshop. Um, the demo app again will be available for everyone to use. So. Um, if you guys are curious, you can execute against pretty much any arbitrary ALIA program and generate proofs. Uh, the only thing to watch out for is now that I have broadcast this transaction, this fee record that I've used for this transaction has been spent. So if I wanted to do another, transi uh, another transaction, I would have to go back to, my, go back to my wallet and get a new unspent record. So give this a moment to sync. Uh, yeah, these are all unspent. So I should hopefully have one that's been returned to me. But yeah, either of these would work because they're unspent. Um, so yeah, every time you run an execution, just make sure you're getting a new fee record. But yeah, I think that's, that's the workshop. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we can demonstrate caching. Oopsies. Good yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't know if we noticed this on the first run, but um, actually, I can go back and hopefully maybe show you guys. This was our run we just did. Uh, I don't think we can see it. but. Memory usage for that first run was pretty high because we were generating the proving and verifying keys. Um, hopefully, on this second run, because we've already done it before, we should be we should be we should do a little bit better than that. So, while that compiles, I'm going to go grab my new unspent records. So, oh, that's the wrong. That's the wrong window. This is the right window. OK. 
that's a new record. I'm gonna run that on here. Okay, there we go. Cool, so we have a new record in there now. Um, we're gonna see if this does better. I'd have to run it a couple times. Uh, ZK Summit. So, okay. This input is our address, so we go back and copy that. assert ourselves another 50 tokens. Cool. Let's run this. So hopefully this should be a, oh, sorry. Um, hopefully we should see less memory usage this time if it's able to reuse the same There you go, that was it. So with the cache keys, it runs significantly faster. Um, no network usage, because to generate the keys, you have to download parts of the SRS string, which we saw in the previous transaction. I think if I go back uh, through the build logs and we look at this one. It looks like I already had um, the SRS strings um, cached, but if I, let me see if I can find a different one that didn't have them. Hmm. I don't think I have a safe transaction, but um, if you were to rerun this with, without cache keys, or if you were to clear the cache and run it again, you would see it that it would have to re-download the SRS string, which is about a, 300 megabyte download up to like a few gigabytes depending on the size of your program. And then it would have to compute the proven keys which would take a while. So actually let's see if I can um, demonstrate that. So if I just delete this from here um, and we delete all the cache data and then we run it again Um, and I'm not going to update the key record because we don't need to broadcast this transaction, but just so we can see it running and see the keys being generated. So first you'll see in the logs that it's downloading the parts of the SRS file, which this one's zero megabytes, but yeah, this can get pretty big. Um, and then you can also see the memory usage here, which is going to spike to probably around a gigabyte, depending on how big the string needs to get. Cool, yeah, so this, this is a part of the string, it's 300 megabytes. Um, and it's going to take a second, so. So yeah, these metrics up here um, kind of demonstrated pretty well. Um, if you were using this kind of, um, if you were using this much data on someone's mobile device and they were not on an unlimited plan, you would use up all their data for the month <laughs> to sign one transaction, so. That is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about optimizations about around do you ship parts of your SRS data with the app? Do you download it on the fly? Uh, there's trade-offs there. If you're downloading on the fly like we're doing right now, um, you're going to be using a lot of network uh, bandwidth, but your app install size will stay small versus shipping it with the app. You could run into a potentially have a multi multiple gigabyte app where most of it is just the uh, SRS data, so yeah. Cool, yeah, and it's not gonna be able to broadcast a transaction, which is fine, but um, 
it, that, that's how long it took to do that transaction without the keys cached already, um, which was significantly slower than when we did it before with the cache keys, yeah. Uh, yeah, we were doing some experimentation with um, an older version of Aztec's prover, and um, with that, that was their Aztec Connect um, code, so it's it's not in use anymore. And this was before they had uh, come up with their optimized provers, you know, Turbo Plonk and Honk and all that stuff. And so, um, yeah, that, that refused to run on my phone because the size of the proving key was uh, more than the available RAM on my phone, and so it would just crash my app. Um, which this is already, you know, uh, if you look at the most recent, at least Apple devices, uh, the most recent ones have six gigabytes of RAM, and then uh, I think the 13 had like four gigabytes of RAM, so, um, I think we've actually, when in our testing, run into a program that generates like a proving key that's a little over four gigabytes in size. So that would not run on a 13, on an iPhone 13, which is not even like that old of a phone. That's two, two years ago. So yeah, definitely very early, definitely a lot of optimization to be done, but it's promising. Cool. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. So if you look at the CPU timeline, basically this is the, this was a time that the proof was generated at. So you'd say, hmm, I can't seem to like pull up actual um, seconds here. But if you look at the memory usage, hmm. I'm trying to see this chart. Yeah, I don't think any of these charts are going to give you a good enough estimation. But essentially, um, it was way longer to actually download the keys than uh, do the proof. Um, if you wanted to compare, um, you can just compare the time that it took to run the cache, uh, run with the cache keys versus without. Um, I think it took us like a few seconds to run it with cache keys, and then without took us, I think, close to a minute. So. Yeah, that's, that's the difference. Cool, any other questions? Oh, sweet, thank you. Um, I mean, that's one of them, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, we, we mentioned like a few, uh, like we mentioned this briefly like earlier, but uh, there's broadly two categories of problems that need to be solved um, for privacy chains on mobile. And the first category of problems is around state management, so managing your UTXOs, um, which is right now involves for most like Aztec, Alio, most chains, like downloading the whole world state and all that. So that's also not feasible on mobile. Um, so for that category of problems, there's like all of, you know, downloading world state, managing state in general, that's, uh, that needs to be solved. But then for proof execution, yeah, sizes of proving keys are definitely one. Um, that's probably the one we've run into the most. Um, but outside of that, there is also actual computation intensity. Um, what we did here was like a fairly simple program, but um, as you were trying to execute more complicated programs, um, you start using up a, a lot of resources and it starts taking longer and longer to l generate a proof, which from a UX perspective isn't great because um, on mobile devices, most, at least Apple and Android, I know that like if you're trying to do very intense computation in the background, it will just kill your process. So. Basically, to run the proof, you have to have your app open in front of you, which is fine if it's a few seconds, but as you start getting into minutes, it starts becoming unfeasible. Um, yeah, something we didn't demonstrate here, but we did run into was uh, when we had this running on just a single threaded implementation instead of using multi-threading, it would take about three or four minutes to generate a proof. So um, that's not feasible, so yeah. And for intuition there, is that just based on the 
like generally the complexity yeah, yeah, generally, yeah, generally the complexity of the contract, how many constraints it's generating, um, and then depending on the trade-off that we're made, designing the protocol itself, um, you know, so, like I think, uh, if you're looking at ASTEC, for example, like between Plonk and Honk, they've focused on um, reducing the complexity of the prover. Um, but like what Zach was talking about earlier this morning about uh, with Honk, they're trying to um, make it so that provers have to do like an order of magnitude less computation, um, for example. So um, yeah, that's that's generally the biggest factor. It's just the complexity of the smart contract and then the actual protocol itself. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, so the multi-threading implementation for this one is just inside um, Snark VM, which is Alio's uh, VM implementation that executes their transaction, and so we just um, leveraged that. Um, just essentially got it to link against multi-threading libraries that are already available on iOS, um, because Snark VM wasn't originally built for iOS, and then so, yeah, that we just leveraged whatever was inside that. But um, as far as I understand, there is, other optimizations you can still do with like GPUs and that kind of thing. So it's definitely room for improvement. Was it, was it, um, was theirs like significantly different? I think I remember Aztec Connects was just like pretty funky multi-threading. Um, yeah, I believe Aztec Connects um, multi-threading implementation was, um, I forget the specifics, but it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't really optimized um, for their code. I think they just kind of uh, took the biggest four loops that were iterating over large sets and just like broke those out into individual threads. But um, I think this implementation is a little more tailored to their actual code. So it's a little smarter. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think with Aztec, we were using Aztec Connect, which is an older version of their code base. So um, I, I think it was a little bit easier to work with Alio. Um, but also, there's considerations around the fact that Aztec is written in C++, which is significantly easier to use um, in an iOS target because it's supported natively um, on Apple platforms. And there's a whole tool chain, uh, there's a whole tool chain that uh, is provided for C++ code on iOS devices with uh, whereas Alio is built on Rust, and so there's no native tool chain. You kind of have to do a lot of work to get that code to run on a iOS device. So, yeah. What do you do when there's no native tool chain? Um, just a lot of improvisation. <laughs> I'd say that. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs>